disclosure, this deck is entirely for a friend. There is a person at my LGS who was struggling to work with Tom Bombadil, and I'm not super familiar, or at least I wasn't super familiar with Tom Bombadil, so I built this deck as an exercise to try to get myself familiarized enough with the deck so that I could actually give him a help. Like, I'm very familiar with aggro decks, aristocrat decks, enchantress decks, but Bombadil is a bit of a different style of that, and I wanted to go ahead and give myself some experience with him. So, without further ado, here is five color Tom Bomba Diddly. Let's go ahead and talk about how we're gonna be playing this guy. Tom Bombadil is a five mana, five color commander. And if there are four or more low lore counters on Sagas we control, he's got Hexproof and Indestructible. So he protects himself quite well. Whenever the final chapter of a Saga resolves, we can reveal cards from the top of our library until we hit a Saga and put it on the battlefield for free. It is basically Saga Cascade, but it only triggers once per turn. So we have to be very careful with how we use him. Now, let's go ahead and talk about what we are going to be doing with him. We are obviously trying to play lots and lots of sagas and letting those sagas be as free as possible, but we want to be able to manipulate saga stuff a lot as well, because eh, sometimes Tom Bombadil's not going to be on the board to do his thing. So let's go ahead and see. The way sagas work they drop a thing down. Let's go ahead and put something here. We drop a saga down, and then it's got a bunch of modes on it. And every single time our main phase begins, we put a counter on the saga, and however many counters are on the saga denote what mode it is in. It is either in chapter one mode, chapter two mode, chapter three mode, depending on the saga. This is modern age. Chapter one and two draws a card and discards a card, and chapter three makes us exile it and flip it and turn it into a creature. So to make sure that we can use our sagas to their greatest ability possible, we are going to be starting with some counter manipulation, as lore counters can be manipulated like anything else. Beginning with Satsuki Living Lore, this allows us to put a lore counter on every saga we control at sorcery speed, and whenever it dies, we can return a saga or enchantment we control to our hand or put one from our graveyard to our hand. Sometimes we are not going to be using Satsuki at all, but we do need to have it available for when we desperately need certain lore counters to trigger. Then we have Goldberry River Daughter, which allows us to move a counter of any kind that's not on Goldberry from a target permanent onto her, and then later we can tap her to move a counter from her onto another permanent and draw a card. Basically, we are going to use this to remove a lore counter from a card, triggering whatever ability it has on its previous chapter, and then we'll throw a lore counter onto a card if we feel like it desperately needs to trigger at a certain point. Remember, we can do this at instant speed as long as we have our untapped, so Tom Bombadil's effect will be able to trigger on other people's turns, whereas normally we are only triggering them on our turn. This is also the reason Satsuki is in here, so that we can get a trigger of a lore ability on every turn cycle and a cascade. One to four of these cascades we get from Tom Bombadil every turn cycle. Then we have Barbara Wright, which allows us to say sagas have read ahead. Read ahead means that when a saga comes down, we can choose which, uh, how many lore counters to put on it when it touches the board. So we can auto turn on a saga, auto use Use a saga if we desperately need to with this on the board. Scholar of New Horizons allows us to remove a counter from any permanent to grab any planes from our deck and throw it onto the battlefield or into our hand, depending on the situation. Then we've got Sigard Jarl of Ravensthorpe. This says that we can boast by paying one mana whenever we swing to it to put a lore counter on a saga or remove one from it. More easy saga manipulation. Then at instant speed, we have Clock Spinning which allows us to choose a counter on a permanent, either remove that counter or put another one of those counters on it. So we can use this to either reset infinitely any saga or trigger it when we need to. It does have buyback, so just consider this a four mana repeatable spell. This will be used to manipulate lore counters the further we get into the game. Speaking of manipulating lore counters, we also have a few ways of proliferating, starting with Grateful Apparition, one of our five proliferators. This and Thrummingbird and Vexing Radgold all say when they hit a person, we can proliferate. That is all they 
really do. Like Vexing Rad Gold does give them rad counters if they didn't have rad counters, and then proliferate if they do have rad counters now. So it's not as strong for our particular deck as our other cards are, but it is still a useful card. And a flying blocker is never a non-card. Then we have Kaith Famed Mechanist. It has Fabricate, giving us access to more token blockers when we need them, and it allows us to either proliferate or populate, letting us either uh, spawn a clone token of a cloned token or allowing us to get a another round of counters on anything that we want. Contagion class allows us to pay four mana to tap it and proliferate while also giving us a little bit of removal built into it as well. And to reanimate our stuff, if they happen to go away, we have Gen Arcanum Weaver that lets us sacrifice an enchantment to return any enchantment from our graveyard to the battlefield and Dance of the Mance, which allows us to get up to X target artifacts or non-aura enchantments with mana value X or less from our graveyard onto the battlefield. If X is six or more, we'll go ahead and turn those cards into 4-4 four, four creatures as well. So this is a pseudo win con for us in situations where it is used for that. And speaking of win cons, we have a few cards that will just end the game for us. Arcana Sun's Grace will give us a 2-2 white Pegasus with flying every single time we drop an enchantment on the board. Eventually, that is too many Pegasi for people to block and they will die. We have Narsi the Fable Singer. Anytime we sack an enchantment, which happens whenever we finish off any of our sagas, we draw a card. And if the final chapter of a saga resolves, each opponent loses X life and you gain X life, where X is that uh, saga's mana value. This will become important in a bit when you remember that populate mechanic that we were using. Historian's Boon says when it or another non-token enchantment touches the battlefield, we make a 1-1 white soul creature token. But if a final chapter of a saga triggers, we make a 4-4 white angel creature token in instead well i mean not instead it's in addition to these angels will eventually just win us the game on their own if they are not kept in check but i want to go back to narcy for a second so she looks on the surface like she will take sagas and just slowly burn people to death with them but in reality if we look at our cloning section she's actually going to do a lot of work so beginning with Yenna Red Tooth Regent, we can pay two mana and tap her to clone an enchantment on our board. If it's an aura, we get to untap her and then scry two. But honestly, we don't have any auras in the deck that we care about. We're just going to be cloning sagas. So I'll get to this in a second again. Ian Chester is our other cloning card that says each saga you cast has replicate, which allows us to basically pay for it twice to get two copies of it on the battlefield. Now, remember that we have the ability to keep sagas on the board for longer than normal by holding on to their counters by removing things with Scholar of New Horizons, Goldberry, and Clock Spinning, and Sigurd. These, all of these, will allow us to keep sagas on the board after they've been cloned for longer than they should. This should allow us to keep Sagas on the board long enough to get Narsi out of the deck, drop it on the board, and then proliferate a couple times, ending all of our Sagas at the same time and burning people for a lot of damage. It's X life, and we gain X life where X is the mana value of the Saga. Most Sagas are like three to five mana, so we should be able to get, oh, I don't know, just a crap ton of damage off of this. Let's say we have four Sagas out and they each cost four mana. That means that Narsi will be able to burn everybody for 16 damage and we will gain 16 times three life. No different than if we dropped a Grey Merchant of Asphodel on the board. This will give us not only flyers as a way to win the game, but also straight up good old burn damage as a way to close out games. So now let's talk about how we're gonna be drawing cards because we've got a lot of ways to do that. Now, obviously, this is an Enchantress deck, so we have lots of draw cards that do draw just by dropping enchantments on the board, but we also have lots of sagas that let us sift through our deck. So, let's begin with the Era of Enlightenment. When we drop it on the board, it scries us for two, then it will gain us two life, and then we can exile it and flip it over to this little 2-2 two -two First Striker. Honestly, it's just here for the scry. Then we have Invasion of Giants, does a scry as well, then it allows us to draw a card and reveal a giant to do things. We don't have 
giants. We just want the draw. And then at level three, it lets us get a giant out uh, for two less mana. But that doesn't matter. We don't have a giant. We don't care about a giant. We just want to constantly reset this to keep scrying the top of our deck and make sure that we always have good draws. Great creation of Avacyn allows us to search our library for any card, exile it face down. And then when it hits turn two, we can turn the exile card face up. If it's a creature card, we lose life equal to its mana value. And then at level three, it allows us to put that card on the battlefield if it's a creature. And if it's not, we just put it into our hand. Honestly, it's just a tutor. It's a three mana tutor that we can proliferate up very quickly to get an instant ability to tutor stuff out of our deck. Modern Age gives us looting twice and then allows us to exile it and turn it into this little two, three enchantment creature. Enchantress's presence says whenever we cast an enchantment, we draw a card. Eidolana Blossoms and Satessia Champion allow us to get a card out of our deck. We draw a card anytime we drop an enchantment on the board. Seder Enchantresses when we cast an enchantment, draw a card, as does Mesa Enchantress, giving us five ways, five enchantresses to sift through our deck with. Then we have Vault 21 House Gambit. Again, this is more looting like with Modern Age. And at the third level, we can reveal it five cards from our uh, hand. And for each of those cards that has the same mana value as another card revealed this way, create a treasure token. Oftentimes, we're probably not going to be using that final ability, not too much, but sometimes it will come in handy. Most of the time, we are just using the looting on this card. Then we have Ballad of the Black Flag. This allows us to mill three cards and put any historic card from among them into our hand, which of course, historic cards are our bread and butter. Sagas are historic cards. Uh, and then at level five or level four, it'll allows us to say that historic spells cost two less to cast this turn. Now, most of the time, this is not going to be super relevant for us. We want to keep this on the board for a long time by resetting its counters. But if our commander has uh, too much command tax, this is a way to discount our commander's command tax. Then we have Bath Song, draw two cards and discard a card for level one and two. And at level three, shuffle any number of cards from our graveyard into our library and add blue mana. This allows us to keep ourselves alive, even if we have milled shuns of cards from Ballad of the Black Flag. Then we have Song of Arendil that allows us to scry two, then draw two cards, and then create a treasure token and a 2-2 bird, and then put a flying counter on each creature we control that doesn't have flying. That means if we've animated a bunch of these sagas and made them 4-4s, this just turns them all into flyers, winning the game for us outright in most cases. And then we have Showdown in the Skulls, lets us exile the top four cards of our library until the end of turn, we may play those cards. And then it's got an ability afterwards, uh, level two and three, whenever we cast a spell, put a 1-1 counter on a creature we control. Most of the time, we're just going to keep resetting this back to one so that we can exile the top four cards of our library and impulse draw and play those cards. Then we have Ezri, Stalker of Spears, because we have a bunch of proliferate. Whenever it enters the battlefield, we can pay three and proliferate twice. Whenever we proliferate, we draw a card. So this is effectively a seven mana draw to and turn on any number of sagas all at once card. It is fantastic. But all that draw power is wonderful. What if we just want our opponents to not win the game? How are we going to be removing all of their threats from the board? We are running a 15 card removal package and it is all various kinds of sagas. So let's get into it. A Johnny Fells the Godsire lets us exile a creature and opponent controls with power three or greater. Then it makes a cat token, and then we give a creature double strike until end of turn. Honestly, we just want to reset this and keep on exiling creatures our opponents have. Then we have Fall of Lord Conda, exile a creature and opponent controls with mana value four or greater. And then each creature, uh, each person gains control of all permanents that they own. And then we exile it and transform it if we want this funny defender that allows us to draw a card. But again, just resetting it to uh, blow up more cards is perfectly valid. Which is Vanity says we can destroy a creature and opponent controls of mana value two or less, then create a food token, then create a wicked roll token. Again, reset it till your heart's content. The Princess Takes Flight says we can exile up to one target creature, then we can make a target creature gain 2-2 two, two until end of turn, then we can return the exiled card under the battlefield. Uh, it's under its owner's control. So um, yeah, just reset this card over and over again with our resetting engines so that we just keep exiling one creature. And then once we hit level three, I think, though I could be wrong, check with your local judge, but I believe that Princess Takes Flight can only return one card at any given time. So if you keep resetting it back to lore counter one, 
then we should be able, in theory, to remove a bunch of cards from the game permanently with this. Then we have Elspeth's Nightmare, destroying a, a creature and opponent controls a power two or less. Then an opponent reveals their hand. We can choose an important card from it and get rid of it. And then we can exile an opponent's graveyard. Vault, 40, uh, Vault 87, Forced Evolution, says we can gain control of somebody's non-mutant creature. Then we can put a 1-1 one, one counter on a creature we control. Then we can draw cards equal to the number uh, uh, to the greatest power among mutants we control. Again, we can keep resetting this to take control of multiple cards. Revelations of Ezio lets us blow up a target tapped creature and opponent controls. Then it's got an assassin ability that we don't care about afterwards. Just reset the card. Then we have Curse of Fenric for each player. Blow up one creature they control and give them a mutant in response. Then target non-token creature becomes a 6-6 legendary horror and loses all abilities. And then target mutant fights another target creature named Fenric. It's a very flavorful card and it's very fun to just speed this down to get that fight mechanic if we want. Trial of the Time Lord says we can exile a non-token creature and opponent controls until this leaves the battlefield. And then it's got a very long and wordy effect afterwards that we are just going to try our best to ignore as we are playing through our games. Fall to the Imposter puts a 1-1 counter on one target creature and then it allows us to exile a creature with the greatest power that any opponent controls. A Crow in War can steal a creature from an opponent and then each tap creature will deal damage to itself, so it is a pseudo board wipe. Binding the Old Gods blows up a non-land permanent, then it grabs a forest card from our deck onto the battlefield, and then it gives our creatures death touch, which is sometimes important. The Flux can deal four damage to a creature and opponent controls, and then it allows us to get some impulse draw for multiple turns before finally giving us just a buttload of red mana. Eldest Reborn lets us force everybody to sacrifice a creature or a planeswalker, then make everybody discard a card. Then we can put a creature or a planeswalker from any graveyard onto the battlefield under our own control. And then Scroll of Isolder allows us to gain control of up to one target artifact as long as we control it. Then we can tap two creatures, put sun counters on them, then we can draw a card for every tap creature and opponent controls. So this is pseudo draw when it ends, but oftentimes we're just going to use this to steal everybody's soul rings, and we're going to keep on keeping this card on the board and uh, constantly resetting its counters so that we own all the soul rings on the board all the time. And we've got two board wipes as well. One is Knight of the Doctor, lets us blow up all creatures, and then lets us return any legendary creature from our graveyard to our battlefield. It's almost always just going to be our commander. Then we have Phasing of Zalfir, which allows us to blow up all creatures and give everybody a 2-2 Black Phyrexian creature token as we blow them up. Honestly, it's the only thing we have in the deck that has read ahead, and we're just going to play this and read ahead and ignore levels 1 and 2. I mean, it does allow us to make a non-land permanent it phase out for multiple turns, but honestly, we don't really need that. Unless we just want to drop it down, uh, phase out our commander, and then proliferate it a couple times to blow up everything. There's plenty of ways you can maneuver around this card, but that's a very hefty removal package for our deck. Let's, uh, let's get into ramp. Now we are a five mana deck, so most of our ramp is gonna be focused on getting to five different colors of mana in any way we possibly can, beginning with Ornithopter of Paradise. This allows us to tap for one mana of any color. So does Arcane Signet, so does Command Sphere, and so does Honored Heirloom, with the benefit of Honored Heirloom being able to exile a card from somebody's graveyard, which is a fantastic way to stop people from reanimating things constantly. Mirror Convert's also in here because it can tap for any colored mana, as will Bonder's Ornament. Bonder's Ornament also allows us to draw cards when we are in a sticky situation. Then we have Core Cartographer and Wood Elves. Both of these can grab a Plains or a Forest, and since our deck is comprised of a Wooburg land package, we do need to be able to grab dual lands that are searchable with these cards. Then we have Weathered Treaty. Let's just search our library for a basic land, put it on the battlefield tapped. Then we get a green sapperling token afterwards. Then we have a domain ability at the end. Azusa's Many Journeys allows us to play additional lands on our turn, and then we can exile it later to drop this likeness of the seer, uh, seeker on the board that allows us to untap three lands we control if it ever becomes blocked. Then we have Forging of the Tyrite Sword, which will give us a treasure token on modes one and two. And then at mode three, it'll search our library for a card that we just don't have, but it will trigger our commander, and that's almost as 
good. And as far as our land package is concerned, we are running two of every basic land, and our dual lands are one, two, three, four, five tango lands with a couple of other green colors covered by viridescent bog and overflowing basin. With the bulk of our stuff focused on these fetch lands here. Ash Barons can get any basic land out of our deck. Crows and Verge can get two lands out of our deck that are forests or plains, which means they can, of course, grab our Tango lands when we need them to. Evolving Wilds and Terramorphic Expanse are, of course, grabbing any basic land from our deck that we need. And we finally are running 10 of our landscape lands. These all come into play untapped and tap for colorless mana, and then can sacrifice themselves for one of three mana types types if we need later on as well. They are fantastic cards that everybody should be running in Wooburg decks if they are running on a budget. Then we have Omni Lands, Path of Ancestry, Exotic Orchard, and Command Tower. Path isn't benefiting us as a card that gives us the scrying ability, but it is benefiting us by simply being a very decent come into play tapped land that will tap for all colors of the rainbow. And Great Hall the Citadel can tap for two colors of the rainbow at any point allowing us to filter, say, one of these lands into itself, but only for legendary spells, which is fine, because most of the time we're going to use this to cast our commander. And with that said, that is the entirety of the ramp section. But what would you say if I said that, you know, uh, maybe you want to spend a little more money on this deck than the $15 I'm building it with? Well, let's talk about how you do that. Now, if you are upgrading this deck, the most important thing to do is to make sure that you do not mess up your mana. Honestly, the biggest problem with Wooburg deck sometimes is that mana can be at a premium. So I've got some ways to fix mana in here. I've got some other ways to get more win cons out, and I've got more ways to manipulate our saga. So let's begin with a straight up win con with Shieldred. This is a fantastic card that makes everybody sack a non-token creature or planeswalker and then we can flip it afterwards to save for each opponent destroy up one creature or planeswalker they control then make everybody discard three cards and mill three cards and then at the end it allows us to put all creatures from all graveyards onto the battlefield under our control straight up winning us the game now, most of the time, we are going to drop Shieldred on the board. It's not going to get removed because people don't play enough removal. We're going to flip it over to the True Scriptures, blow up a bunch of things, and then after we make people discard three cards, we're going to immediately counter manipulate it and put it back to one, blowing up another creature on everybody's board, eventually allowing us to drain everybody's resources so much that they don't have the ability to stop it. If we play the card, flip it, blow up three creatures, make everybody lose a combined total of nine cards, and then counter manipulate it back to one, blowing up three more creatures, and then proliferate up with any of our multiple proliferation methods, we have effectively made our opponents lose a combined total of 20 four cards, not counting the six extra cards per player we've put in the graveyard. That almost guarantees that True Scriptures will have a game-winning amount of creatures on the board, and that is eight cards per player that are all gone. That is an entire hand and a good chunk of a board state that will all be missing. True Scriptures is ridiculously bonkers. Then we have Undo Spirit Dancer. When it enters the battlefield under our control, we may create a creature, uh, we may create a token copy of that card once per turn. More ways to copy our sagas is always great. Hall of Heliod's generosity is wonderful utility in letting us reuse our sagas. Kiora Best the Sea God can help us create a giant army of 8-8 eight, eight hexproof krakens by constantly resetting it back to its first counter. Speaking of ways to reset our counters, Hex Parasite and Power Conduit give us more access to counter manipulation. Power Conduit can tap to remove a counter from a permanent, and Hex Parasite can let us pay X mana and two life to remove X counters from any permanent. At multiple times, any time that we want. Like just this, this thing, this is the guaranteed need. If you don't have a Hex Parasite in your Tom Bombadil deck, I don't know what you're doing unless you're paying hyper budget or you can't afford it. 
Then we've got Stratic Resonator to copy triggered abilities of any of our sagas. Kami War giving us another way to exile nine land permanents from our opponent's boards on a saga. Eviver Wolf Kissed allowing us to mill a bunch of cards and then put a saga from any of them onto the battlefield for free. Sithist Harvest Hand is another way to draw cards in our setup. Weaver of Harmony allows us to copy triggered abilities of sagas. Sanctum Weaver allows us to add lots and lots of mana for all the sagas we have. Brago King Eternal is another way to reset our sagas, letting us just blink them all and drop them on the board, putting them back at lore counter one. Nature's Lore and Farseek are more ways to mana fix ourselves. Bellow, Bard, and Sigil of the Empty Throne are two more win cons. Sigil will make 4-4 four, four angels, and Bellow Bard will turn all of our auras into 4-4 four, four elemental creatures. Be warned, though, only do this when you are about to win the game with those creatures. It also has a draw power attached to it as well, but primarily this is here just to make sure we win with a bunch of 4-4s. Four Starfield of Nyx can get our entire graveyard back onto the battlefield if we play it. Resurgent Belief can do the same. Horus Heresy allows us to steal cards from every opponent and then draw cards for every creature that we control but don't own. Reset Horus Heresy back to lore counter 1 and 2 over and over again to gain massive advantage. Then we have Trickster God's Heist. We can exchange control of two target creatures and exchange control of two target non-basic non-creature permanents that share a card type uh, basically use this to give people mana rocks you don't need and take good cards they have and take important creatures like say people's commanders away from people and give them little tokens that you've made little one one tokens spawn from sagas angel tokens pegasi tokens whatever you've got just hand them those it's got a final ability that makes a player lose three life and you gain three life we are never going to use that. We are going to use this to take everybody's commanders and turn off their ability to play the game because everybody builds decks that do not function without their commander. Our deck functions without our commander. It isn't as strong, but if we don't have Tom Bombadil out, the deck is still running as a powerful Enchantress engine, so fuck Tom. That said, let me know what you think about all of these upgrades. What upgrades would you add? But uh, that all said, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and wrap things up here. In conclusion, Tom Bombadil feels like he's a ridiculously fun commander with his own self-protection built in and a draw engine built in with his little Saga Cascade engine. All that's left to do when you are playing the deck is properly manipulate your Sagas. As for what we are doing, our deck is actually running 33 enchantments, 29 of those being Sagas. So we've got a surplus of ways to make Tom Bombadil work. But again, the deck should function even when Tom Tom Bombadil is not on the board. All he's doing is giving you an engine to keep going through and grabbing more and more sagas. But the deck will function regardless of whether or not he's on the board, especially if you go maximum overdrive on enchantresses, maybe adding in an Argothian enchantress on top of everything as well. Elbush Mystic is, or not Elbush Mystic, uh, Elbush Archivist is also a pseudo enchantress that I really, really love. That all said, I want to know what y'all think of Tom Bombadil. I know he's been around for a bit and I wasn't really doing these deck lists around the time that he came out, but uh, let me know what you guys think. Let me know if you have given Tom Bombadil a try yourself, and if you have, how much success have you had with him? Have you been enjoying playing him? Do you have any advice for people who are trying to get into playing him? And also, this gave me a really good way to help out my friend's deck, so let's go ahead and, I'll go ahead and do that this weekend. That said, let me know what you all think. Hit the like button if you haven't already. Subscribe if you haven't already. Go ahead and share this video with a friend if you think that they will like to see this kind of deck and they like budget builds. Who knows? That all said, I will see you all in the next one. As always, insert end of video tagline here. Hey, just wanted to give a quick thank you to all of my wonderful patrons who help keep me afloat and help keep this channel going. YouTube and Twitch are wonderful platforms, but at the end of the day, stability is not one of the strong suits. If you want to support my channel, then obviously Patreon is one of the best ways of doing that. Link is in the description. But I do want to personally thank everybody who has contributed to the channel. Those people would be Red Joker, Purple Poundini, Gemption, Briskrieg, Jupe the Malignant, Michael, Ravalern, Mabbity Babbity, Astral Frontier, Autumn and Angel, Nixie Chan, Mark Anthony, Victorian Alchemist, Sagitt- I'm not saying the last part of that and you know that! Arctan Arc Lassier, Curatorian, Dren Hadamata, Jordan M, John L, Lord Bleck, Smiling Game Master, and Fire Shard. 
and everyone else who supports my channel and lets me do what I do full time. This is a dream job of mine that I never believed that I would be able to take full time, and with your help, I've been able to do it. So thank you so, so very much for that. Thank you for watching the video. I hope you all enjoy, and I hope you all are having a wonderful time. I will see you all in the next one, hopefully.